Um, I've been asked to talk about a recent book of mine, which is uh, called Victory at Sea. Many of the older members will know about the music and the television program of Victory at Sea back in the 1950s. And it is a deliberate echo of that, but it is actually also a book about uh, using um, the paintings of a noted marine artist called Ian Marshall, now deceased alas, who had done a fair series of, of beautiful paintings set in a geographical circumstance of various aspects of warships in the Second World War. The uh, book took a considerable length of time to bring out, I have to confess, partly because of Ian's passing away and partly because this was the first time that I had um, actually co-authored a book or co-worked with a book in that I was to uh, you know, put in the, the text of this work, write a single volume history of a war at sea in the Second World War and wrap my comments and my paragraphs around Ian's paintings. The best publisher for this work was uh, Yale University Press, well regarded because of the way it did so many books on maritime history and, and maritime and landscape uh, paintings. And so over time, over six years or so, uh, I, I, I moved on uh, with Ian's passing and Christmas a couple of years ago to this work, Victory at, at Sea. It brought me back, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to some earlier works of mine, uh, one of which many years ago was called The Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery, in which uh, I try to argue the case that over the 400 year span of the history of uh, sea power from you know, 1500 to 1900 into the 20th century, uh, you could see various naval powers coming to the fore, but the, the British were at the fore. The British were at number one in terms of naval power for such a length of time because it coincided with their relative success in being the number one trading nation, number one financial nation and industrial nation until the two world wars of the Second World War, uh, especially uh, and the coming of the great American power meant that Britain had to decline and go into the number two and then maybe the number three or four position. Still, this idea of writing about sea power in the long term uh, pushed me later on to do a work which is called The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which came out in 1988, and uh, was tried to look again at the relative position of all of the great powers since the formation of the, of the nation states in 1500 through until the beginning of this 21st century. Um, it used an awful lot of statistics and it didn't have any illustrations at all in it. So once again, uh, it was a different sort of book. It was only when six years ago, I agreed to join forces with the marine artists Ian Marshall and to produce the text for his beautiful series of paintings that um, I came back again to a naval history topic and I came back again to the Second World War. Um, the work itself, and I, uh, excuse me if uh, things went wrong on my side over here at Yale this past week and I did not get um, illustrations to you. Uh, the work itself uh, consists of uh, a, a narrative form of uh, this, the war at sea starting in the, of course, the European theater for the first two or three years of the war and therefore uh, the first two or three chapters before Pearl Harbor comes along and turns it into a truly global maritime contest. I should say for all of you who have this deep affection for and interest in the story of sea power in the war in the Pacific, 
it is rewarding from time to time to try to look at the other two great naval areas of contestation and the two other areas in which sea power uh, unfolds itself. That is to say, the three year long or so uh, very tightly fought battle of the Mediterranean from the time Italy comes in in the summer of 1940 until Italy's surrender in 1943. And then again, the longest naval war of the Second World War, which is the Battle of the Atlantic. I think that when you look at all three and you reflect on it, you can see that sea power takes different forms. It, it just isn't the form that uh, we know about in the war in the Pacific, a war in which it starts off with the sudden attacks and destruction or heavy damage to the US battle fleet at Pearl Harbor, the American steady recovery, the knocking out of the Japanese carriers at Midway, and then the slow advance coming out of the Southwest Pacific and Central Pacific, all the way across through those amphibious landings. That is indeed an epic story and an epic uh, way of looking at sea power. Chiefly by 1942, aircraft carrier sea power. What if sea power manifests itself in two very different ways when we turn to the other uh, areas of, of battle. What if the six years of the Battle of the Atlantic was overwhelmingly once the few German surface warships had been chased home or sunk or like the Graf Spee sunk themselves? What if, what if it was about steady attempts by Admiral Dernitz's large and increasingly large U-boat forces to, to sink the Allied merchant ship convoys coming across from the United States and Canada or up from uh, Freetown and West Africa to take, to take reserves and sources to the British Isles. And the attempts of the Anglo-Canadian uh, escort forces to beat off the submarines. What if at the end of the day, it was a score of millions and millions of merchant ship tonnage lost, a large number of small escort vessels of the British and the Canadians lost, but an epic number of U-boats lost. But the war went on until the very, very last stages in uh, April and May, 1945. And yet when we switch to think about the Mediterranean battle, or what Donald McIntyre in his early book called the, the Battle of the Mediterranean. We see there it has very much to do with fighting at all levels, air, sea, and under the sea, in an attempt by the Royal Navy to keep sending supplies and sustenance from Gibraltar through all the way to the island, the beleaguered island of Malta, sometimes further, to Cairo and to the Suez Canal in an effort to stop and bottle up the Axis attempts to reinforce and gain an overwhelming position in North Africa. Air power is terribly important in the Battle of the Mediterranean because these are closed waters. And you can have a large number of Italian, obviously, and German air bases in North Africa and Southern Italy and Sicily to try to interrupt the flow of the British reinforcements to Malta. Air powers of considerable importance to the British, of course, because if they manage to keep even a small number of Hurricane and Spitfire squadrons on Malta going out to attack enemy forces and to get control of the air over Malta, and if a relatively few number of British carriers coming into the Mediterranean themselves can get protection in the air over their escorts, then they have a chance. So the structure of my book, Victory at Sea, uh, is after two initial chapters in which at the urgings of some uh, non-naval historians early on, 
I decided to uh, agree with their request and have two early chapters on the geography and uh, economics of the sea power war in the Second World War, and another chapter, very important to them, on warships and navies in the Second World War, trying to not only detail and describe what all of the different types of warships were, but look at the six navies involved. Remember, the Second World War also brings in for at least a year the uh, French uh, Royal Navy, uh, La Royale, and then also, of course, the German Navy and the Japanese Navy, as well as the Anglo-American navies and the Italian Navy. And then also um, the Admiralties concerned. But I had to spend those two chapters clearing the way for my readership before the chapters which take the story through in the War of the Atlantic, the War of Norway and Dunkirk, the war in the Mediterranean, leading to the battles around Crete and Greece, and then the switch at the end of 1941 with the coming of the war in the Pacific. From then on, the later chapters, you know, seven, uh, nine, 10, 11, are trying to tell the story of a war in all the oceans. Uh, the chapter in which I deal with the year 1942, ladies and gentlemen, is called A War in Every Sea. It is probably in that year, the, the, the fighting most year in all of naval history. I think I had to go back and try to check whether I was um, making too big a claim. Was not the year of 1797 when the British were fighting, you know, off the coast of uh, northern France and in the lower North Sea, as well as in the Mediterranean and off um, Egypt? Was that not the fighting most? But I think it's fair to claim that in the year of 1942, sea power and sea air power were in contestation uh, across the three big ocean and sea areas that I'm talking about here. The different thing, or the thing which makes this book somewhat different, I suppose, from your regular, even the very nice illustrated history of sea power in the Second World War, is that once again, because of my own interest in the economic and productive backdrop and circumstance behind uh, relative power for great powers. It, there's a chapter eight in which uh, there are no illustrations by Ian Marshall. There are, however, considerable number of statistical tables. So in this work, and let me just remind people who are maybe dialing in now that what you're looking at is this particular work here, uh, Paul Kennedy, A uh, Victory at Sea. In this work in chapter eight, there will be, uh, I stop the clock in around the year 1943, give or take into late 42, give or take into early 1944. But I argue the case, ladies and gentlemen, that it's in 1943, that the tide turns. The tide has turned rather more decisively already in the Mediterranean theater because the Anglo-American armies have landed on the North African shore after the Battle of uh, the Torch landings in November 1942 and the end of Italy's presence in the war by the middle of 1943. But it also changes, of course, in the Battle of the Atlantic because by May and June 1943, for some very special reasons to do with new instruments of war and new forms of defensive fighting by the, uh, especially the Royal Navy, uh, they're, they are able to beat at last the U-boat attacks in a convincing way, detect them at night because of new miniaturized radar and pummel them to the extent that by June 1943, Dönitz is feeling steadily in his guts that they have lost the Battle of Atlantic, even though he's going to fight on for another two years. And in the Pacific, well, we think of 1943 as being 
a sort of quiet year in terms of great fleet battles, right? We have Midway in the center of 1942 with all of the, all of the heroics there and an enormously fast turnaround in the story of the loss of the, of the Japanese carriers. And 1944, of course, sees uh, really big works, really big uh, operations by uh, U.S. Navy, especially Central Command, pushing all the way through eventually to take over the Philippines after the Battle of Lady Gulf. But 1943, in the backdrop, there's something happening which those of us who concentrate chiefly on the battles those of us who concentrate chiefly on naval tactics or even the importance of a leadership in the struggles in the Second World War uh, don't pay attention to or don't pay enough attention to. In the late spring of 1943 uh, in the Southwest Pacific, uh, Halse was you know, limited to just a single U.S. carrier until it's joined for just a very brief period by a Royal Navy fast carrier called the Victorious. But in early June 1943, the first of the Essex-class fast new fleet carriers arrives in Pearl Harbor. How much Nimitz must have rejoiced at that. And by the next month, by... By July 1943, another carrier has arrived at U.S. Central Command, Central Pacific Command, and in the next month, another one. So that by the end of the year, ladies and gentlemen, when the operations go forward to take over the Gilbert Islands, the U.S. Central Pacific Fleet has no less than 10 aircraft carriers. Some large fleet carriers, some of the new fast, medium-sized carriers, but there they are, o over a thousand carrier aircraft, fighter bombers, dive bombers, fighters themselves. There's no way in which Japanese uh, naval production, Japanese shipbuilding can in any way match the gigantic resources of the United States. All of these new vessels, and I include here the increasing numbers of new fast battleships coming into the Central Pacific, the new heavy cruisers, the new light cruisers, and dozens and dozens and dozens of destroyers, and also fast oilers to accompany these, uh, these, these ranging, wide-ranging forces. There's no way in which the Japanese can match this at all. By 1943, also, U.S. aircraft production has gone up in, in astonishing ways. I do recall that in that earlier book of mine, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, I do put in a statistical table borrowed from the great Air, Air Force historian Richard Overy of the comparative aircraft production of the Great Powers in the war, but I come back to it now in this book, Victory at Sea. What does it mean? What did it mean in the battles of the Mediterranean, of the Atlantic, of the Western Europe, of a strategic bombing campaign, and of the fight in the Pacific? That US aircraft production could shift from 20,000 aircraft in one year to 40,000 aircraft and then to 84,000 aircraft in 1943, and 96,000 aircraft produced in 1944. The figures are, are staggering. I have to say, when presenting these statistics and talking about the enormous surge of American aircraft carrier production or aircraft production in the second half of the Second World War, on a number of venues, whether it be Yale clubs, whether it be historians conferences, whether it be television programs, when it comes to question and answer time, I am asked, you know, could the United States possibly do anywhere close to half of a tenth of 
that sort of productive surge of 1942 to 44 could it do it possibly today as we face the rise of a large Chinese Navy on the other side of the Pacific? And the answer is definitely no. All sorts of aircraft are much, much more expensive today. All sorts of warships, including submarines, are so, so much more expensive. The numbers would be quite limited. Whether they would be as small as actually is the case in our shipbuilding efforts today, I leave it for you and your congressman, ladies and gentlemen. But the fact is, returning back to my own remarks here, the fact is that by June 1943 onwards, the shift in the relative balance of productive force had itself uh, been, been turned into enormous physical output. Uh, if you were telling the story of a war on land, it would be of tanks, of armored ve vehicles, of trucks, uh, of landing crafts increasingly for the amphibious forces. At sea, it is the story of an of a increasing surge in naval reinforcements to Nimitz's fleet, and then at a lesser extent to the Southwest Pacific fl fleet and the the forces under MacArthur's command. There's a sense, and I wonder if other historians of the war in the Pacific have, uh, have had this feeling, there's a sense in which one moves out of 1943 into 1944, and especially into 1945, where one could tend to be almost... Um, accepting of the inevitability of things. You might well say, look at the size of a statistical flow of warships and aircraft and carriers and everything on the American side compared with far smaller reinforcements to the Japanese Navy and Air Force. Isn't it all over? And it means that I think uh, we are in danger of trying to uh, minimize, or I may be in my books in danger of minimizing the significance of the great battles in 1944, the, the uh, great Marianas Turkey shoot, an extraordinary fight there in, in the air, extraordinary elimination of so many zero fighters by so few losses on the American side, and then the advance to the Philippines and the epic Battle of Lady Gulf, and then following the fall of the Philippines, one might think that the story of Iwo Jima and Okinawa is a relatively small scale naval aerial contestation. And yet we know not just that it was so tightly and bloodily fought on the island of Iwo Jima and later on of Okinawa, but also it was fought um, in a very bloody way off the coasts of those two islands, especially with the new Japanese tactic and weapon of the kamikaze, such that the American losses continue right through to the end of the war. There is, in the last chapter of this book, between myself and the marine artist Ian Marshall, an extraordinarily beautiful painting, which I would uh, suggest you will enjoy looking at when you get the book itself, ladies and gentlemen. It is of the uh, Anglo-American warships anchored in Tokyo Bay in September 1945. The war at sea is over. The negotiations for surrender have occurred. Uh, the Japanese delegates have come onto the poop deck of the USS Missouri and signed the act of surrender and then gone home. Uh, American forces are taking over Japan and all of its ports. And they're late in the day, as the American forces, as the great American carriers and battleships with the British 
carrier also clearly identical there, identifiable there. You see in the background of Tokyo Bay, those of you who've been to Tokyo will know it, a Mount Fuji. The sun is setting over Mount Fuji. The war is over. The rising sun has settled. It's terribly bloody, but really relatively swift. Three and a half years of fighting in the Pacific is over. That is almost the penultimate painting in Ian Marshall's attempt to capture the war at sea and victory at sea uh, through, the, through the artist's eyes. There is one other one which I also enjoyed putting in at the end of a book, and it is of um, the heavy cruiser USS Augusta, which had been for so many times the, the, the vessel which carried the president, carried FDR to his various key conferences. Uh, in one of the harbors in the southwest coast of England, across from the British fast battle cruiser HMS Renown, which had been the most, it was the surviving one of the three battle cruisers. Uh, the Hood and the Repulse had both been sunk in earlier actions. And the Renown uh, representing Great Britain and the Augusta representing the United States uh, were there just to come to the end of that epic set of meetings which had been over in Germany at Potsdam, um, allowing Truman, the new American president, to come back into the United Kingdom. And then uh, after various meetings and dinners with the king and everything else like that, to be boarded to the Augusta, which would then steadily head westwards. And as the Augusta went westwards in the early days of 19, August 1945, the atomic bomb would be dropped on Hiroshima. By the time the new president arrived back in the US and went to give his explanation of things to the two houses of Congress, uh, the war was over. Uh, the Japanese had to surrender. Uh, they had to ask for peace. The second atomic bomb had been dropped and the conflict, the bloody conflict was over. So, Victory at Sea is a, it's a book I much enjoyed writing. Some of us will uh, be candid enough to tell our friends and to tell certain audiences that this book took a lot out of me and another book was a, a very enjoyable work. Um, British Naval Mastery, I enjoyed a great deal. Um, Engineers of Victory, I enjoyed a great deal. This one, being able to take Ian Marshall's wonderful illustrations once again tell the story of the war at sea in three different theaters, not just in the Pacific, was something that was a joy to me. But it was important to me to try once again to suggest to the naval historians that if we stop the clock in 1943, and as I do so, looking at chapter eight and the shift in the productive balances of power, we see there's something big going on here. History, when it unfolds, especially at the time of great wars, is not only that story of conflicts. It's not only the story of great leaders, although heavens above we had such great leaders in Churchill and Roosevelt and great naval leaders and, and Air Force leaders as well. It's not only the story of the uh, design of ever newer, more powerful battleships, aircraft carrier, cruisers, and newer types of submarines. It's also the story of what happens at the home base, in the home industrial society, in the transformation of the American war force, in the way in which congressional dollars pouring in allow the sleeping giant, as Churchill called it, the sleeping giant of great American unused industry and technology to turn around and to produce the weapons for war. Again, I quote Winston Churchill 
when he said, give us the tools and we will finish the job. Isn't that so interesting, ladies and gentlemen? Give us the tools and we will finish the job. Let's hope we have enough tools uh, to keep us strong, deterring, in a peaceful mode, able to, and to send messages out to the rest of the world that we have the capacity still. But the echoes of what went on in 1945, uh, the great struggles there, and uh, the story of the leadership uh, on the one hand, the fighting men on the other hand, and the production story is such a one that I feel I've been honored to get back into it. So with best wishes to you all, uh, to my uh, group of small participants listening in, I'm so thrilled to be with you here, so thrilled to have been able to tell the story of, um, I put it up again, Victory at Sea. And um, I wish I was with you, but I am in very, very cold New England. Thank you so much indeed. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. We have a question, sir. I was wondering if there were any uh, major observations that you had in your earlier books, such as Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, that changed coming into this book uh, in, in Victory at Sea. I think that, uh, thank you for a, a, a really profound question about, do, you know, do historians change or do they evolve? Do they, do they learn themselves in retrospect, looking back at a book they've done decades ago, whether the new one would be slightly different? I think it would be this, but it's because of the nature of the two books. There is something in the rise and fall of a great powers which remember has as a subtitle, um, military conflict and, and economic change from 1500 to the year 2000. So 500 year sweep. There's something in that work which you might call uh, inevitabilist. Something that is, um, you know, you Kennedy feeds in the statistical uh, projections of the shifts in the relative balances of power and the rise of the British industry in the 19th century or the coming of a massive United States. And then uh, there's a shift which leads to a resolution of the next war going in favor of the power which had the greatest productive capacity. There's something repetitive and there's something you might say uh, inevitableist. Here I am accusing myself uh, when I had the chance to come back and uh, join Ian Marshall with doing the victory at sea, I, I could slow down. After all, I've only got the six years of the Second World War. And I've got a long period in which I'm trying to describe the war uh, in the first three years of continued Allied losses, right? Uh, the British uh, Royal Navy, the French are knocked out within less than you know, nine months of the beginning of the war, the British are driven out of Northwest Europe. They're pummeled when they try to go into Norway, which is so close to their main Scarpa flow base. You would think it would all go in the other direction. They have a terrible time just trying to extricate their forces from Dunkirk. When Italy joins the war in the middle of 1940, they have another terrible time while the both Axis powers as it were, run rampant. And then the news comes out of the Pacific that Japan has not only attacked Pearl Harbor, but is running all over Southeast Asia, has taken over Malaya, Singapore, moving into Burma, moving into the Indian Ocean. The story, the, the book there has to be one in which I'm able, and I much enjoy doing it, able to tell the story of contestations of conflicts, able to make some judgments myself of the, the remarkable battles, remarkable campaigns. So while my overall story of, yes, when there's big shifts in the productive industrial technological balances, at the end of the day, then that new power with the rising economic force 
has a better chance of taking over. I think I was able in Victory at Sea to enjoy myself looking again at armed forces in action and especially at navies in action. I came away from uh, Victory at Sea shaking my head at the, uh, the, the courage, the intrepid nature of the persistent strength of resolution of the Anglo-American navies in the Second World War. How one could be going across that Atlantic month after month, year after year, feeling that U-boats were out there in increasing numbers, trying to sink you, and hoping that you made it, even though you can hear the great explosions of the sister merchant ships next to you. How you could leave Gibraltar going uh, eastwards towards Malta, fearing that once again you'd be the subject of repeated dive bomber attacks. So yes, uh, this book was different from Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. You might say, Professor Kennedy, when you look at chapter eight, it looks rather similar. Lots of statistics about economic shift. But there's much more in this book because it is about the fighting man in the air, at sea, and under the sea. Thanks for your question.